Hi, my name is Evelyn Vanderhoof. I'm Haida. My Haida name is Kajuf. I'm a weaver of the chief's robes of the Northwest Coast, the uh, Raven's Tail and the Nahin. So I recently had the honor to write an essay in um, an, a book that um, has um, many uh, prestigious and knowledgeable uh, researchers, and so it was quite the honor to be asked to contribute to this book on settling native histories on the Northwest Coast. When they asked me to do that, I was in, in the middle of um, really reading and researching old stories that were collected by my people here in Haida Gwaii. And these stories came from people that uh, came to visit and stayed a bit and learned some of these stories. So John Reed Swanton was one of those ethnologists. So um, he collected a lot of stories from the Skidigit people, from the Masset people, and then he went up north and collected from the Kagani Haida and also from the Clinket people. So he, he gathered quite a lot of stories and those stories have in them tucked a lot of cultural elements that are have gone by the wayside here in our, our uh, present time in 2020. And so uh, you really need to do a lot of work of reading and researching old documents and uh, to try to figure out how important these robes were. I mean, we know they were chief's robes, we know they were prestigious, we know that they declared identity um, in where we stood in our hierarchical societies of the past. The subject that I chose for, for that essay was um, about some little known designs and designs of importance that we find in our textiles today. So we know about the crest designs. We know that we um, declared our identity in our apparel, and what we were wearing on our heads, on our robes. Um, a lot of the um, ethnologists and uh, anthropologists and people who look at our art, our ancient art, our art that has survived the ages, they look at them and then from their cultural lens, they assume things. And so in their assumptions, they write them down and then it gets printed and then it becomes um, etched in stone practically. But if you bring your own cultural knowledge to those documents, then you can see some misinterpretations that happened. And so I think it's important for um, the people now to recognize that the living people of these cultures do have knowledge that has been passed down to them. And it is, it hasn't always, and that knowledge hasn't always been printed. It comes down in oral histories. I know in my family we have uh, stories that I have heard as a child, and now I have told my children those stories. And those stories I don't find in books. So we have knowledge from our ancestors, and we are living um, bridges to uh, the younger generation, and our art helps us remember those cultural elements and that cultural knowledge. But not everybody has the advantage of having these stories passed to them, and uh, so, so it, it takes a lot of digging into the past to find uh, what these patterns and how these textiles um, were important. We use the word nahin to describe the form line art of the, um, the textiles here along the coast and any chief worth his salt would own one of these robes.
uh, and even still they're important. Um, but the research that I've been doing recently has been on the raven's tail. Now, the raven's tail was called the Northern Geometric Weaving. And they call that because the Southern people did also have a tradition of weaving geometric robes. But in our tradition up here in the North, uh, we use gravity weighted uh, looms and the people down South actually have um, the top and a uh, bottom where their warps are not uh, hung with just the weight of gravity. They have the um, a roller sit, set up with their looms. So we do construct our robes in a different manner. And we also have different symbols um, that mean different things. And we might even have the same symbols, but that mean different things. So um, it is the designing that has been really a, something that I have wanted to um, know more about because our, um, our coast had so many um, waves of epidemics in um, deadly diseases that we really lost a lot of people and we lost them swiftly. So we lost a lot of that ancient ancestral knowledge. And so now we have to really do a lot of searching to um, find out what, to, what these symbols that have come through the ages, what they mean and how important they were um, and how important they are still. I was very honored to be asked to contribute an essay to this very important book. There were so many um, really learned people and it was quite, quite an honor to be asked. It was a, a big assignment though. I'd previously written essays for well, actually, the first book that uh, was published through the Bill Holm Center um, was the book In the Spirit of the Ancestors, and I wrote an essay uh, pertaining to the Nahin weaving, the Chilkat um, weaving of the Northwest Coast. I was encouraged by how well received it was. I had the honor of, of um, writing a little bit um, in the 50th anniversary of the uh, the amazing book uh, Bill Holm put out way back in this. They had a 50th anniversary a few years back and they asked me to write some words about Bill and how he was involved um, in my art and um, and helped me. So that was quite the honor. I was then asked to write an essay for this book. And I had, I had just recently uh, been studying at the Yale uh, University, the Beinecke Rare uh, Book and Manuscript um, Library there. And I, had no, I knew at that time that I was going to be um, writing an essay and so what was uh, interesting to me at the time was these little known uh, designs that are found in our uh, geometric pattern robes. And it had to do with um, the power of the sky and also um, the power of the sea being. And uh, in our stories, the sea being controls the waves, but it, they thought to also control the weather. And so in my research, I've found many instances in our, um, in our oral history stories that had been collected early on by John Swanton in the 1900s. Uh, and in my research, I also have been researching the early explorer documents, diaries and, uh, and captain logs. But while I was at the Beinecke, there was, uh, so many uh, things that came to me pertaining to the power of the sky 
And I knew in our stories that there was um, the story about the sky robes. And so in my research, I, I just kept an eye out for everything to do with um, power symbols about the sky. I was at the right place to be researching for this essay. And then I was invited to go to teach in Cape Alaska to teach a Raven's Tale course. And, and in, in order to get to Cape, you can't catch a ferry and go to Cape. You would have to catch a ferry and in Wrangell catch a, a plane or Sitka catch a plane. But I didn't want to do that. I had the time. So I got on the ferry in Prince Rupert and then I went all the way up to Skagway and then coming down again down south, uh, then I got off at Cake. So I had a couple of days on the ferry and and all of that amazing, beautiful Southeast Alaska scenery, um, being alone on that ferry and uh, traveling uh, through the waters of Southeast Alaska. I was thinking about how the explorers, what, what they saw when they first saw our country. And then I was also thinking about the, the people I've been reading about in the stories and, and them gliding through the waters in their beautiful canoes. Um, it all was very inspiring. And um, with, um, with that time on the ferry, I was able to start the uh, essay after studying at the Beinecke and, uh, and then, then going through the, um, the waters of Southeast Alaska and, uh, and then weaving in cake. So I was happy to uh, put all of my research and my thoughts down about uh, the the rare um, uh, power symbols that our ancestors used in the designs of our textile. Sky blankets have been a mystery to me when I read these stories about um, the past and the supernatural adventures of our ancestors. And in a few of the Northern Haida stories that were collected here in Masset, they talk about um, sky blankets. And so I'm like, what did the Haidas mean when they were talking about these sky blankets, these ancient blankets? And why were they called sky blankets? And are these raven's tail robes that we now are weaving now, are they sky blankets? Were they what was being referred to? So um, I read this story. It was a supernatural being who went naked. Um, and he, in this story, he was the hero. And he went out and he wrestled sky people. This is what they, they say in these stories. And um, what's wonderful about reading the stories that were collected way back in 1901 um, by uh, John Reed Swanton is that he approached uh, people that uh, and told them what he wanted. He wanted to research the uh, ancient literature of the Haida. So he did find uh, people throughout our villages and they were interpreters for him. So he didn't just take these stories down in English. He took them down in Haida with the help of Haida. And so there's a lot of knowledge tucked into those stories that he collected. And so this particular story about supernatural being um, who went naked, um, they, in this story, he talks about the sky blankets. And that's what really piqued my interest uh, in this story. So he goes out and he wrestles um, the sky being. But before he does, because all nine of his, his um, 
other brothers had gone and wrestled earlier and they had lost. And they were thrown into the sky beams uh, homes and lost. So he wanted to strengthen himself. And one of the traditional ways of strengthening uh, here on the coast was to go into the water, the cold water, and, uh, and do that often. And so he went to strengthen himself and he found a man who would wrestle, was a wrestling partner with him. And it was, he was an old man and uh, a very strong man though. After many uh, sessions of wrestling, he beats this strong man. And so the strong man says, you're ready. He said, go to your house. Your mother has something for you. So the man goes back to his place and he walks into his house. And there his mother is weaving on the, um, next to the wall. And he says to his mother, Mother, uh, do you have any? And they don't really, uh, in the story, they don't really specifically say um, what it is, but the mother knows what he means. And, he, and she says, yes, when you were inside me in my womb, I had these made. So here it is, a grown man asking for something that his mother had kept for him until he was ready for it. And so she got two sky blankets. And so in his venture to rescue his brothers, he wears these sky blankets. And um, another interesting thing that kind of connects to this story is that in um, even before the missionaries came to Masset, there the Hudson Bay people established a uh, trading post here. And one of the earliest people that was assigned to the Masset trading post was a man called Alexander Mackenzie. And he has no um, relation to the famous explorer, but he was a Hudson Bay officer here in Masset. And he was here quite a, many years. So he talks about first-hand knowledge that he got from the Haida people. And one of the stories he, he uh, reveals in a, in a document that I, I got to research uh, was that he was told by a medicine man, we here in Haida, we call those medicine men skagas. Um, so this skaga told uh, Mackenzie that there was uh, that in a vision, the sky people, the cloud people, were seen in a vision, and that now these people are symbolized in a uh, symbol that resembles um, the letter T. So they talk about how um, the bottom of that T is, represents the horizon, and then above that horizon is the rest of the T. For the Skaga to reveal how cloud people are symbolized in design uh, made me want to uh, connect uh, more of the sky patterns to the sky blankets. And the explorer Vancouver was very keen to observe what the people were wearing when he came to the coast. He talked about seeing cedar robes, but that they had mountain goat wool designed areas um, on their edges. There was an artist that came to the coast and his name was um, Sigmund Backstrom. And he painted watercolors of Haida's. And in one of the paintings, Haida is wearing a cedar robe. You can tell that by the color that he painted that robe with, the brown. and. And then uh, there was designs, and then on the bottom there were the um, the patterns that Vancouver had noted, and um, and that I have seen when I researched these uh, early collected robes at the museum in London. Then I get go back into the stories of the Haida, and in those stories there's names that talk about sky symbols. All of that was really interesting because because sky symbols, they're uh, not really that known. The eagle, the raven, the beaver, 
um, even supernatural beings, they were prevalent, right? And diving whale was one of the most uh, prevalent designs on our form line ropes. But we don't really know too much about the symbols that um, were from the powerful uh, sky. So uh, I thought that it would be a good subject to talk about those symbols because so many people, like I say, the, the anthropologists who are assuming things, um, they say that some of these patterns are just placeholders. Well, I really think that every single element in these very powerful robes meant something. They had a message or they had a story or they were part of a story. So those kind of hidden symbols, uh, I think were very powerful. They brought something to these robes as much as the more prevalent uh, and easily recognizable uh, thunderbird, uh, raven, diving whale, um, those big um, beings that we are um, more familiar with um, share uh, in, in the messaging with the uh, lesser known sky symbols. I learned so much in my research that I wanted to bring that out in this essay. I've been researching all over the world, practically. Um, but my most exciting discovery was in the British Museum, me and my children, uh, and my sister April and her eldest child, Paula. We all were um, invited to go to the British Museum. April looked at the basketry collection and she gave them notes about what she observed. And I looked at the textile uh, collection and I gave them my um, my ideas and thoughts and so but they pulled out a couple of robes that were collected from Haida Gwaii and that always is of interest to me is uh, the textiles that were collected on Haida Gwaii. Well this one robe had quite a lot of um, uh, knowledge about who collected it, when, where, and that's very rare. A lot of times these ancient uh, robes are collected by fur traders or um, tourists that brought them down to some trading post. or um, So you don't really get, uh, usually you don't really get much detail about the collection knowledge. Um, but this one robe had been collected by a captain of a ship, a British ship, that came along the coast and it stopped only for one day in an ancient village of Kung, which is just up the inlet from where I am now. And it, and he took it from Ascaga, a medicine man's uh, burial place. We know it was a medicine man's um, place because he also took implements of from that grave site and so it was an amazing robe it just was exquisitely woven and it it just it kept haunting me and so I was like why why does this look so familiar where have I seen this design before and I realized that the um, shoulder pet design was very, very similar to um, a beaver dance apron that um, I had studied and that I'd seen a lot of pictures of. And the shoulder, the way the weaver and the designer had handled the shoulder and the arm design was exactly like how the arm and shoulder designs of the beaver apron, apron were, were held. And then I found out that um, the, that the, another, a clinket researcher 
who worked with the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Louis uh, Shotridge, had written about that beaver apron. And his ancestor had told him a story about how the original beaver apron that they own now in the whale house, how that apron came to be up there in Puklong. And it came from um, a trader who had come to Haida Gwaii. And there was a whole story that this uh, Lois, Lewis Shotridge's relative had told him this story about how it came from Haida Gwaii, northern Haida Gwaii, and went and, and got ended up in Kukwan. It's a long story and I won't tell it here, but, um, but for me to know that that beaver apron came from northern Haida Gwaii and then this robe that had the same similar uh, way of handling the arm and shoulder uh, came from northern Haida Gwaii, come. That made me think, wow, there was a designer here in northern Haida Gwaii that created the patterns for these robes. And, and I'd like to someday uh, get really good photographs and of both those objects and put them together and just see. I think, I'm pretty sure the designer designed both those objects, but was it the same weaver? Was, did the weaver that wove that apron also weave that robe? And so um, that, those, that's a mystery still. But um, I would really like to see those objects put close together and, and, and see that. And it's exciting to, um, to go all the way to London and, uh, and see that connection of, of something that we now have in Alaska and something that's now in London and that has a, um, a Haida connection. Both of them have a Haida connection. And uh, those are exciting um, discoveries for me. And uh, another exciting discovery that I had way back in the year, um, uh, well, actually it was in 2005, because I had gone there to study at the National Museum of Natural History in 2000, but the collection, uh, the Hay collection from New York had not been brought down to the new museum there at the, at the uh, mall. So uh, they invited me back in 2005 to study the collection um, now that it was in place. And so I went along and, and uh, studied uh, not only what was in the museum, but was it that, that was in the, um, the storehouses. You get kind of uh, almost dizzy studying and studying and seeing these, these things. And so um, I thought, oh, I will take a break and I will walk along the, uh, the aisles of the, the shelves and the, of, of all these wonderful, amazing objects that aren't textiles but that I'm interested in seeing them too. So um, I was walking along the shelf and here was this plank and it had painting on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is the pattern board for a tunic. And it was way off in the carving corner. It, it wasn't part of any textile collection or anything. And I, and I thought, do they even know that they hold the tunic, but in addition to holding that tunic in their collection, they also hold the pattern board because they're not together. And I, so I, I went and I talked to a curator and I said, this is a pattern board. This isn't just a painted plank. It's a pattern board for a tunic and you, you hold that tunic in your collection. And so anyway, I got to, um, they, they were excited about it also. And so they took photos of me um, with the uh, tunic and with the pattern board. And so that was another exciting moment of um, my research uh, that I was able to help them uh, put those two objects together 
And um, so those kind of things happen. And um, I want to keep, I want to keep on researching. I think that, I think that's one of the reasons why my mother is always active and my grandmother, Nani Selina Paradovich, ahead of her, um, they, they're in their 90s. My, my Nani passed away at 96. My mother is in her 91st birthday or her 91st uh, year. And I think that's what keeps them young or that's what kept them going, that keeps them going is, um, is always being curious and always wanting to learn. And there's so much to learn. I would someday love to go to Russia. I would love to go and see the museums there. Um, they they are hold they hold so much from the early the earliest um, people that came to Alaska to see us and to um, and to collect um, the really early early objects and so I would love to I'd love to go there to to Russia and see that so that's yet to be done. I think museums and institutions that hold our art and our documents, I think that they have an obligation to the people of those uh, objects, of that art and of those uh, documents. And, and so those museums that hold these ancient, um, ancient objects and knowledge need to continue to uh, research uh, with increased knowledge from the indigenous people. I used to work at the Totem Heritage Center as a um, public programmer. I was an intern, so it wasn't a, a, a long stint there at the Totem Heritage Center. I enjoyed the experience. And one of the things that I really, really thought was wonderful about the Totem Heritage Center was they really honored the voice of the indigenous people from the, out, um, the outlaying communities um, in Prince of Wales Island and in Saxman and uh, all the areas that surround Ketchikan, Alaska. They are the uh, holders of the totems that they, through uh, a combined effort with, with the parks uh, system and the um, the organizations, the native organizations in Ketchikan, they brought these totem poles and um, this this art to stand and to be held at the Totem Heritage Center. And they honor the elders, they honor the, the people by having them be part of a committee. We had a good amount of people that were Clinkett, Haida, and Simsian in that committee. And so they really uh, were guided by, by that. Um, and they invited them into um, everything that they did. They informed them what they were doing with those objects. If they were having an exhibit, they uh, brought those uh, people in to ask them for guidance. And uh, so during that time I worked at the Totem Heritage Center, I really liked that part and that was long a lo long time ago that was like 20 years ago when when I was working there that they had that committee and so I think that museums do have an obligation to reach out to the people of their their area and even further the people if they hold um, an art object from from um, Mexico or an art object from Arizona, even though they're on the Pacific Northwest coast, that they should continue to contact people from 
the cultures that the objects originated from because um, then you will get to know more and how they fit into um, those cultures and then they will be able to tell the general population more about what they hold and why they're important. More and more people are doing what the Totem Heritage Center did. I work with the Burke quite closely and they are uh, wonderful at making sure that they honor the people by not just um, talking about them, they continually refer to them on an ongoing basis and they include them in their committees of uh, decision-making committees um, when they exhibit and so um, that is really important. Another thing that um, the museums now are doing and that I think should happen more and more is that there's an honoring of the languages and uh, there's a recognition that the language of the people are highlight the thinking of the people. That language um, represents a big part of uh, the culture and how we can see into the culture by understanding the, um, the languages of those people. I just recently was in a pretty important show, uh, The Hearts of Our People, and it opened up in Minneapolis and um, and each label was uh, not e not only done in English; it was also done with the, the with the language of the cultural that these people uh, came from, so that uh, that there is more understanding of the art object.